I'd like to um, introduce Jenny Taylor. She is one of our amazing neuro-oncologists um, and she has a research interest in the cognitive health and quality of life, which is very, very important, especially in our low-grade glioma patients and also our high-grade glioma patients, but she will speak to us on the current management of uh, high -grade, or low grade gliomas. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Suzanne. And uh, thank you to everyone for the um, opportunity to present today. Um, hopefully you are seeing the presentation. Yep. Great. So I think in light of um, Dr. Perry's talk this morning, I think this, this talk should probably be actually called uh, current management of IDH mutant gliomas. And so I think that that's certainly where we'll spend most of our focus today. And we have a wonderful opportunity to see a lot of these patients here at UCSF. I do have a few disclosures uh, receiving research uh, funding from all of these uh, pharma several of these pharmaceutical companies, and I will touch on Agios today as well. So just a brief comment um, on the incidence of low-grade gliomas. So these are generally um, very far less common uh, than the majority of, um, of many different gliomas, including glioblastoma. However, these are patients that tend to be younger with the median age of diagnosis at about four, 25 to 45 years old. And these are young people with abrupt onset often of symptoms, uh, severe headaches and seizures of otherwise healthy productive members of society who are in the midst of developing their careers, completing their education and family planning. They often live longer with a median survival of nine to 17 years, which is far out, out uh, exceeds the glioblastoma patients that um, Nancy Ann will discuss next. And so even though only about four to 5,000 cases of diffuse low-grade gliomas are diagnosed every year, they are actually the largest percentage of patients alive in the United States with gliomas and therefore warrant a, a specific consideration. So I know a lot of this was reviewed by Dr. Perry already, but I did want to highlight again as we turn to the treatment of these tumors, how classification has really had such a huge impact. So until 2016, the WHO classified CNS tumors, specifically adult diffuse gliomas, based on histopathology with increasing grade um, associated with increasing cellularity, nuclear atypia, microvascular proliferation, and ultimately necrosis, and either consistent with oligodendrogliomas or uh, astrocytomas. This, however, is a very subjective grading and is limited both by the size of the biopsy tissue as well as the expertise of the pathologist. And this resulted in marked variability in survival outcomes within each grade and histology, with some grade two tumor patients, some patients with grade two tumors surviving a very short period of time, and other patients with glioblastomas potentially surviving for more than a decade. And this unexpected variability is a significant challenge for us as neuro-oncologists in discussing treatments for our patients in clinic. However, as we've highlighted multiple times today, this all changed in 2009 with the discovery of the mutation in isocitrate dehydrogenase. And not to, to belabor the point, but it, this is a functional mutation involved in cell metabolism and results in the production of 2-hydroxyglutarate. These IDH mutations were noted to be vastly more common in historically classified grade two and three tumors and found to be very rare in glioblastomas. And as an added bonus, immunohistochemistry was able to quickly and easily detect the presence of the IDH mutation, allowing for us to gather this information very quickly and incorporate it into the decision-making process when discussing with our patients. And so this motivated the WHO in 2016 to reclassify tumors uh, based on the histology, plus the presence or absence of IDH mutation as the primary molecular uh, feature, and then providing an integrated molecular diagnosis. And this has been very helpful. And this is, as we currently stand, even though I know we're on the verge of, 20, of WHO 2021, this is how we're classifying tumors currently in clinic. And based on these different subtypes, we've been able to make more homogenous survival experiences in subtypes for patients. So here are examples of Kaplan-Meier curves with patients with IDH wild-type tumors on the left with a very short survival curve, and Nancy and we'll discuss that further, all the way up to um, oligodendroglioma patients, which as I discussed, may survive for several decades. 
Additionally, molecular markers, which haven't been discussed extensively today, but including TERT and HRX, which are involved in telomerase alterations and also very uh, significantly uh, researched here at UCSF, we have sought to further class subclassify gliomas into even more homogeneous survival groups. And then over the last several years have been, has been the boom of methylation signatures that have continued to expand our understanding and further subclassification of gliomas. So with this increasing knowledge that molecular disclassification may be, dare I say, superior to traditional histologic uh, diagnosis, the WHO will go even further in prioritizing the molecular classification and uh, all the sequencing and neuropathology that you've heard today will continue to, to further our advances in this realm. However, the, as we turn to the clinic and how we're currently treating our patients and discussing our patients in, uh, in seeing them day by day uh, in the office, this is a slide that summarizes the seminal studies over the last several decades that include uh, the improvements of treatments that we've made in advancing the outcomes for these patients. And we, of course, need to layer this on, the, on, the, on top of the context of molecular advances that, we've, uh, that you've heard a lot about this morning. So we've known for the last several decades that radiation at diagnosis for low-grade tumors may in fact improve progression-free survival and seizure control does not necessarily improve overall survival. We've also known that certain histologic subtypes, particularly oligodendrogliomas, confer a significant sensitivity to chemotherapy, as examples here with PCV, procarbazine, CCNU, and vincristine, and certainly add to the survival experience when combined with radiation for, for lower grade tumors as well as oligodendrogliomas. Additionally, we have evidence that temozolomide, the alkylating agent approved in glioblastoma, which we'll hear about more, does improve survival in, in combination with radiation for higher grade astrocytomas, so ID, to IDH mutant astrocytomas, and it's thought to maybe be a bit better tolerated as uh, toxicity wise than CCNU which is the C and the PCV. However, with all of these studies, please note that the accrual dates and the publication dates here are really quite old. Sorry, most of these studies started in the late 1990s and even early 2000s. And you can see that the accrual took often decade, a decade in order to um, uh, reach accrual. And this highlights the challenges of trial enrollment for these patients, and on how long it can take to get these things, to get these studies resulted when the primary outcome is survival. And then the publication dates that are highlighted here, again, often five to 10 years after study closure, demonstrating um, the time required to see distinguishing survival benefits across different treatments for these very slow growing tumors. And then all of this is in the context of predating certainly all the accruals and most of the publications or several of the publications during the process of um, identifying and really using IDH as such a significant marker and incorporating it more into the clinic. So this also has been a challenge as these phase three studies have matured at the same time of the discovery uh, and of not just IDH, but even further molecular subtypes. So, this is, this is what we're trying to accomplish here. We are trying to delay tumor progression. So this is an example of a young man, 20 years old, graduate student who underwent a research MRI scan and was incidentally noted to have this T2 hyperintense lesion. It was followed of the subsequent seven years with evidence of growth, and he underwent a resection that in fact confirmed an IDH mutant astrocytoma. He went on to receive radiation and chemotherapy with temozolomide. Four years after completion of treatment, unfortunately, he developed progressive disease. Additional surgery confirmed malignant transformation to glioblastoma. He was involved in several clinical trials and received additional aggressive therapy, but unfortunately, he developed disseminated disease with ependymal spread in these areas noted in red and passed away 12 years after his original diagnosis at the age of 31. So this is unfortunately, it's far too frequent a story that we hear this is a tragic example of a bright young mind that was ravaged by this disease and is certainly what motivates us to be very aggressive early on in the treatment of these for these patients. So we're trying to balance tumor progression against toxicity. 
So as Dr. Bronstein alluded to, radiation is a very effective treatment for, for, uh, for low-grade gliomas and all gliomas. However, there are significant prices that, that can be paid for those who, are, who do benefit over long periods of time. This is an example of a, a, a patient with radiation necrosis, and you heard about radiation necrosis from Dr. Cha earlier today, and also from Dr. Bronstein. And this is a woman who developed radiation necrosis for her treatment of oligodendroglioma just a few years after um, completion of treatment and developed new neurologic symptoms. Here's an example of cavernous malformation that's been slowly growing in this poor gentleman for the course of several years, per causing progressive uh, worsening left-sided weakness, also from uh, several years after radiation. And then you've heard a lot about the hypermutated phenotype today noted in uh, treated treatment with temozolomide that can happen with patients um, as well at any sort of time and any extent of, of amount of uh, treatment with temozolomide. So our challenge here is balancing tumor progression with long-term toxicity. So here we are in the clinic. This is the, the framework of what we know, clinically speaking, on overlying molecular information as we face our patients day by day. Data from large phase three clinical studies, the, which, is, which are fairly old and predate the molecular era, and the risks of these long-term toxicities for patients who may live for decades. So here's four young adults, all less than 45, all working, all parents who presented with either seizures or headaches. They all undergo ex different versions of, of resection, some with notable discrete areas of disease and some with more diffuse disease. And we're all found to have all, of the, uh, all found to have IDH mutated tumors, either astrocytomas or an oligodendroglioma. So how do we approach discussing treatment options with these patients, balancing the treatments we have the most data for, radiation, chemotherapy, with the anticipated risks of long-term cognitive and quality of life uh, toxicities from, as a consequence of these treatments, which I think you'll hear more about from Dr. Wiretamore later today. And better yet, do we have alternative treatments that may be more targeted and less toxic and allow for delay of radiation and cytotoxic treatments and extend progression-free survival without, of course, sacrificing overall survival? So where, where are we headed here? So back to IDH. So again, IDH is very common in low-grade tumors. It's an oncometabolite that, ha that certainly is very, it involves, uh, creates gliomogenesis and can be very disruptive for cell growth. So is this something that we can target? And the answer is yes. IDH inhibitors have been on the market now for several years. They're predominantly approved in, um, in leukemias, but they block the mutation and have been shown in gliomas to decrease the 2-HG uh, in the tumor sample itself. So ivocidinib was the first on market. It is an IDH1 inhibitor and has, been, and has demonstrated benefit both in stabilizing non-enhancing tumors, as you see here in the, water, the waterfall plot, with um, uh, most patients achieving stable disease versus enhancing patients, which unfortunately don't respond quite as well, and improvement in overall uh, improvement in progression-free survival. Again, for the non-enhancing tumors, much more superior than the overall um, than than the enhancing overall survival patients. And uh, enacidinib, which is um, a target for IDH2 inhibitors, which is uh, IDH2 is far far less common than IDH1 mutations, but is still something that we see in gliomas and has been used in the off-label setting. And then voracidinib, which is a pan-IDH inhibitor and is the, the subject of a large uh, international phase three study called the INDIGO study, of which this is the NCT number and that we're participating here at UCSF. Just a brief word on PARP inhibitors. So PARP is a DNA damaging response inhibitor that disrupts base excision and single strand um, breaks. IDH mutations actually induce a homologous recombination defect that are thought to be particularly sensitive to PARP. And PARP, are, is, PARP inhibitors are being investigated with temozolomide as well as in single agents and multiple different types of um, gliomas, including IDH mutated lower grade gliomas. And then a word on immunotherapy. So immunotherapy has not yet dem been demonstrated as significantly beneficial um, in most primary brain tumors, unfortunately. However, lower grade gliomas do offer, confer uh, an opportunity to potentially benefit from immunotherapy. They have a relatively intact immune system, unlike their counterpart uh, glioblastoma. They have slower growth and allow for repeated vaccinations and generation of um, higher T cell response. 
and they're being investigated in ways to sort of vaccinate against malignant trans transformation. Here at UCSF, we've had the opportunity of, of being involved in two quote off the shelf peptide vaccines. So this GBM AD uh, plus poly ICLC, which is an immunostimulant. So patients actually receive vaccine before their resection with the primary outcome of this study uh, demonstrating um, assessing immune response within the tumor tissue itself as well as IMA950 plus the immunostimulant poly ICLC and the CD27 antibody verilolumab. So again, the primary outcome of these two pilot studies is to, is to actually be, assess the immune response in the tumor um, and correlate with systemic immune responses and of course, survival for these patients. So these novel approaches, immunotherapy targeted approaches, as well as others that were not discussed in the interest of time are hopeful opportunities for new treatments for our patients. They're often well tolerated with low side effects and may extend progression-free survival and also provide some insight into opportunities to um, use different markers, not just overall survival in order to generate uh, data more quickly and allow for an ever, they allow us to keep up with an ever evolving molecular landscape. So in just the last moment here, very, very quickly, um, this is just, again, back to our original patients. Um, after surgery, we would propose mechanistically um, to have patients undergo immunohistochemical analysis for IDH mutations, and then um, if the IHC was negative for subsequent sequencing. And then based on their histology, uh, clinical trials would certainly be the, an opportune moment, and then uh, either chemo monotherapy, active surveillance, or aggressive treatment with radiation and chemotherapy can certainly be considered. The opportunity for, for, uh, for a proposed uh, algorithm in recurrence is a, but is a bit more complicated. Again, clinical trials are still at the center of all of this, and there's lots of opportunities for surgical and non-surgical clinical trials have been discussed today. And other considerations for bevacizumab, off-label drugs, as we've discussed, and immunotherapy may also be relevant. And then all of this treatment is not standardized, and decisions are really based on um, patient symptoms, their performance status, their prior treatments that they've received, uh, their extent of resection, which Dr. Berger and Jumper highlighted are so important, and then changes in pathology and sequencing, which really should be driving our decision-making process. And so in summary, though IDH-mutated uh, gliomas comp comprise a small amount of percentage of primary brain tumors, the advances of the understanding of molecular underpinnings has really improved classification, though our, our data with treatment are still delayed, and so there's a challenge that we have in rectifying those those two things together. So I'd like to thank the neuro-oncology team and uh, again for your for everyone's attention today. Thank you.